All right. So as I was saying, there was the concern about whether or not dispersion plays a role, and, and this is the, the record of wave height um, taken in Australia after the 1960 Chilean earthquake, which led to a tsunami. And what we're seeing here is, OK, so um, this, of course, this, this big sinusoidal wave is, is just the tidal record. And so then on top of that, you begin to see. So over here, it's smooth. Of course, it's noisy because there's high frequency noise, the, the small amplitude waves that are always seen in a harbor or anywhere. And then there is something here. And that's viewed as uh, the first depression in, in, in the paper. And then, and then there are some other things. And then over here, where the tidal record is pretty flat, you, you see um, relatively high frequency oscillations on the order of, of half an hour, um, or maybe higher. I guess it's worth sort of counting um, peaks there. It looks like it's it's higher frequency than half an hour, more like ten minutes. What would you say? We get a consensus around ten, something like that. So, um, so that's the data, and we should always keep in mind. Um, what, uh, what the data tells us, because if our models don't match that, it can be embarrassing. <laughs> um, so, because simple-minded people, again, you know, people like in Congress in the United States will ask simple what? questions. I know that. I know that. <laughs> and I love these people, and I respect them highly, and they ask good questions, just like, just like kindergartners do. You should always talk to kindergartners. They will ask you embarrassingly simple questions, and you should have good answers for them. And so we need to do that. We need to understand where do these um, oscillations come from. Um, so many of them without decaying. Of course, now you could say, well, th these are really chaotic in here. How are you going to describe that? I don't know. That I don't know about. It. We'll have to talk about that. But that's something to keep in mind. Um, and um, we talked yesterday about the idea that Chile provides an opportunity for a laboratory for these things. And, um, and we have the opportunity to guide. This is a big data problem, but one in which we can guide the, the taking of data. And so we can think about that. We can think about one thing we might do with these models we produce is to say, where do we think it would be most important to take data? Where is the weakness in our model? Where is it we don't quite understand things? So let's keep that in mind. And this, this is data that we have. And we can, going forward, think about where, where might we want to get more data, better data. Um, OK. So with that, let me go back to death by PDF here. <laughs> so um, let's, let's go to full screen. So as you recall, I'm, I'm taking things very simply. And I was encouraged by people yesterday to keep it simple. And so those of you who are just sucking up to the teacher, you know, it's your fault if I'm doing stuff that's too simple. But anyway, we're going to do that. And um, let me just, I want to review the first slides. Um, first of all, everybody got the email that I had deposited my slides on, on Piazza? OK, good. I'm absolutely certain I didn't do it correctly, but yes. Where does what come from? Oh, the the number six. Oh, my apologies. I'm messing around with these are the mathematicians playing loose with with constants. Uh, you know, you you can have um, you know there could be any constant here here that you want. And notice I don't have the linear advection term here. So this is just one way of, of writing the equation. I, I apologize for that. I change, I change frequently. And in fact, I realize that I often don't use the physically correct coefficients. And I apologize for that. It's just, you know, in, in numerical analysis, you, you think you can take every coefficient to be 1 and fix it later. <laughs> so. Um, in this case, fixing it later means that you will do it better than I did. That's the idea. 
So that's where the six comes from. I, the answer is I don't know where six comes from. Um, so, um, but in any rate, I, well, where it comes from is that I, I somehow wanted this to match this equation. So that's where it comes from. So if you want exactly this expression, you have to have that expression. But um, it's, uh, there's, KDV has uh, an invariance property, so you can, you can uh, change wave speeds and so forth, and you would still get a, a KDV-like equation. Um, and then we're looking at this other equation, which I said is much easier to integrate because ultimately it comes down to what is here an ordinary differential equation, meaning this operator B is a bounded operator. Um, you might say, well, on what spaces? Well, for example, you could say this is a bounded operator on a Sobolev space. A Sobolev space is a space that of functions which are square integrable on the whole real line in this case and have a certain number of derivatives that are also square integrable. And this operator B has the property that if you have S, if you have a function with S derivatives, then B times that function will have S plus one derivatives. And there'll be a, a constant that will represent the, the bound. Of course, it's non, in this nonlinear relationship, it'll, it'll be a nonlinear relationship. But still, it's bounded in terms of derivatives. And it's the the derivatives in, uh, it's the loss of derivatives in a PDE that causes you to have constraints on time stepping, the so-called CFL condition, and, and other, in, in, in something like the heat equation, it's a different constraint that, that you have to satisfy, say, for an explicit time stepping scheme. And it's because the operator you're working with is uh, an unbounded operator on a Sobolev space, whereas here we have a bounded operator on a Sobolev space. So this is really quite an unusual beast. So it's a, it's a PDE that doesn't look like it, it doesn't feel like a PDE. So it's kind of interesting. I mean, just sort of going off on the side here, uh, this makes it interesting to think about as an example if you want to teach people about differential equations. Here's a way to ease into the subject because you've got a PDE that actually works like a, an ordinary differential equation in some sense. Um, so that's, that's an interesting feature. And from a computational point of view, it makes a huge difference. And so um, it means that you can use relatively high order time stepping schemes without worrying about uh, the relationship with respect to the spatial discretization. So I'll talk more about that. Um, there, there are other features, in fact, that or even the, the, the form of B is, is significant. And I'll talk about that and, and say what. Uh, you, you can do to take advantage of it. Um, so I mentioned briefly something about modeling. I'll say more in detail about this as we get deeper into the story. But um, the basic idea is that, yes, it's, it's really just an advection equation at heart. This is what carries the day. That tells you all the information you really need to know about wave propagation of tsunamis. They go across the, the ocean as if they were linear advection. That's, that'll tell you when they will arrive, because they're very small amplitude. Um, we're, we're arguing about details now. And the details allow you to uh, switch from this triple x term to the minus xxt term, because the basic equation is ut is minus ux. And so the KDV is essentially equivalent to the BBM equation. And I'll tell you. I want to say a little bit about that theorem or what are theorems that have been developed to, to prove that because it's an interesting example of modeling at, at a more refined mathematical level. Um, I mean, for example, you can ask um, how well does and under what conditions does KDV model Navier Stokes? I mean, there should be a theorem there that says if these parameters are small, if this amplitude is small, so it actually converges to the Navier Stokes equations. And I'll just mention a little bit about this particular equation because uh, it's, uh, it's a very well understood um, situation and it is relevant. Uh, in particular, you might have come in this room believing that somehow the KDV equation here is interesting, but this BBM when you say, whoa, wait a minute, I've never heard of that, why should I be interested in that? And so there really is a theorem that says this is a rigorous um, approximation. And, and I think that's an interesting 
kind of theorem, and so I'm proselytizing a little bit for theorems of that type. I think that's one of the things we're missing in applied mathematics at the moment. Um, for example, in the field of rheology, there are more models than there are modelers. That was a joke somebody made some years ago about it. Um, uh, and I view that as not so funny. <laughs> I think that modelers should have a responsibility to sort out their models, and theorems of this type would be useful in, in that, that area. So I, I, one of the things I want to talk about when I talk about modeling in a little bit more detail. Um, so I, I brought up this controversy, which has, has been amplified by this, this meeting, that we don't understand whether or not, uh, or the extent to which dispersion uh, is uh, uh, important, or at least I don't understand the extent to which uh, dispersion is important. And um, we have went over a little bit in depth of how what we know about tsunamis, and, and that um, led to um, um, some, some things that would, would help us um, study that issue. And then I looked at some simple solutions of the BBM equation. There are, there are a variety of them in, in different regimes. In the, in the strongly nonlinear regime, when the amplitude is big, you get solitary waves or solitons. That is not so relevant for, um, for tsunamis because they're too big amplitude. Um, just to remind you, we're thinking about the, the length scale here is the depth of the water. Now, it depends on where, what you're interested in. If you're talking about a laboratory experiment, um, the depth could be relatively small, a couple of centimeters, for example. Um, but in the ocean, we're talking about depths of at least tens of meters, if not 10,000 meters in, in the deep ocean. So an amplitude of one would be a, a wave you wouldn't, you know, nobody's ever talked about waves that big even when meteors hit, I think. Has anybody ever seen that? How big, how big is the wave supposed to be when a meteor arrives? Does anybody remember that number off the top? I don't remember. But I can't imagine 10,000 meters. <laughs> that's a, I mean, that would be the, you know, that's the, these, it, interpreted in terms of water waves, solitons have a height greater than the depth of the water they're in. So they're, they're really not, they're not, doesn't make any sense. Now, in other contexts, and, and I, I'm, I'm not really that knowledgeable about the different applications of KDD and BBM in, in other contexts, but in other contexts, it may actually be relevant that you have uh, these large amplitude solitary waves in a, in a physical context. But, but here, it's just a mathematical um, nicety uh, it's relevant from the point of view it's an exact solution to the differential equation, and that's always a good thing to have when you want to check your numerical scheme, and you'll see me using that for convergence studies. So it's useful for that. And then it has this fun nonlinear wave interaction, uh, which, of course, was a, a real shock when people realized this and sort of changed physics from being fully linear to being fully nonlinear now. So, so that's uh, a, a lot of interest. But now here comes the, this question about dispersion. And, and what I'm trying to indicate here is by taking a, a series of Gaussian um, initial data, I just picked Gaussian because it's smooth and it's easy to program, but you could, I would hope you would experiment with other waveforms, initial waveforms, and see what happens because you can do that. This is one of the things that I'm, I'm advocating here. This was all done on this little machine, very light machine. You, know, you could do it on an iPad. You could do it on your iPhone, I think, but uh, that's a more of a programming problem. Um, and so what happens? So, well, you, what you see is that you, you start with this very symmetric wave, and all of a sudden it goes asymmetric. So it's prop the wave, basic wave is propagating to the right, but it emits a, what we call a dispersive tail. So it just starts wiggling. It's like it's flapping or something. And um, it doesn't move much to the left, but it does move a little bit to the left. Notice it does have a kind of a backwash behind it. That's significant if you're, if you're computing these things. You have to place this far enough away from this artificial boundary. This is a computational boundary. It's not a physical boundary. If you have any interaction here, it can, it can screw things up, which I suspect if you start playing around with these codes, you'll find that out. They're, 
I, I haven't really talked much about the, the pitfalls you'll find, but these are nonlinear problems, and nonlinear problems can blow up on you. And, and so you, you have to have things sufficiently well resolved to, to see this. Um, okay, so, so you see this dispersion for a certain Gaussian, and the question, of course, is how, you know, how relevant is that? And, and, and I, I pointed out this is quite different from what you would see if you had a purely nonlinear effect. So that was dispersion versus nonlinearity. And um, if you have just a nonlinear term, uh, of course, you get a totally different character. Uh, it's, it's interesting to, to realize that there are, in a sense, um, ultimate forms that are taken on. In other words, here we have a Gaussian that breaks up into just the simple ramp solution. And uh, before, what we had was a Gaussian breaks up into these dis so-called dispersive tails. And there is something to that. There is underlying this something called the Airy function, and, and the Airy function plays a big role. And basically what you're seeing here is the Airy function in different, different scalings. Um, now, I started playing around. I said, well, OK, but so this dispersion thing, um, what happens if, you know, I don't know what the initial shape is of the wave generated by the earthquake or the landslide, whatever generates a tsunami. So I said, well, let me just try different shapes and see what happens. I, so you've seen what happens with the Gaussian. Let me take something that's asymmetric, and I just took e to the minus x squared times x. So you'll get something that goes up and then down and then back you know, down to 0 um, as an example. And so um, you get what you see here. So again, you see a dispersive tail, although it seems to be going in the opposite direction. So in fact, here things tend to move a little bit to the left and the dispersive tail is, is going out this way. There doesn't seem to be much, or at least not so much, of a leading wave in this case. And do notice that I've taken the amplitude down here to be 10 to the minus 4. And so if our depth is 10 thousand meters, then this is a one, one meter amplitude wave. So I'm, I'm trying to get into the more interesting regime for, uh, for tsunamis. Um, and you could say, well, what if that the, had the depression on the right? What if you have the depression on the left? Um, so that's e to the minus x squared <coughs> times minus x. Then you get something that looks similar in a way. And if you just go back and forth, what you realize is that one is minus the other. And, and this is essentially a, a, a linear problem, and so that makes sense. That, yes, in fact, you do essentially get minus of the, the, the uh, other. So, so that's what happens if you take a Gaussian and a Gaussian times something that asymmetrizes it, and I suggest you play around with it and see what else you, you might find. And, and then you, you can now be empowered to get involved in this discussion and say, well, you know, the reason dispersion isn't relevant is blah, 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 or the reason dispersion is relevant is blah, blah, blah. And that I think that's one of the nice things is that um, computing has gotten to the point where really everybody can be doing it on their, their iPhones. And this is probably a better use of your iPhone than <laughs> checking your email all the time. Um, that's, you know, there is actually an interesting comment here about, you know, people like on an airplane, they'll have a you know, some sort of device, an iPad, for example, and they're sitting playing some dumb game, you know. Well, there are also notions of, of community computations that you can do, like, like protein folding at home. And, and so that's another game you could be playing on your computer. And, and so if we come up with questions that we don't have enough compute power to handle, we could create a game like that, and we could get people to sit on airplanes and their iPads and solve equation x and send us the results mm -hmm. <laughs> and this could this could you know mm -hmm. avert the next uh, world disaster who knows so a model to think about okay so <clears throat> um here's where i, I look at a, a series of um gaussians and and i've been more explicit about the coefficients the amplitudes are all taken to be essentially one meter in the in the in a ten thousand meter uniform channel uh, a depth of 10,000 meters. And um, I've taken different spreads. So the constant C 
uh, here is the spread of the, the wave. And I, I don't quite know how to say what the, the wavelength is for a Gaussian, but so it, I was explicit with C. So you can see different values of C. And so for C equal to 0.004, then now you really see very little dispersion. And so, so here's where you could, you could honestly say the dispersion is just a minor effect. But, of course, if you change C a little bit, you'll start to see more and more dispersive effects. And as, as C gets um, bigger, then the dispersive effects get bigger. And so, you know, I, I invite you to play around with this and, and see what you think, what, to what extent it's, it's relevant. Um, the, I mean, let me remind you of the units down here. One, if, if we're taking the deep water canonical depth of 10,000 meters. Um, so one unit here is 10 kilometers. So uh, this is from here to here is 100 times 10 kilometers. It's 1,000 kilometers. So that would be a relatively big wave. We're talking about waves that are measured to be on the order of 100, 200, 300 kilometers, perhaps, perhaps more. Um, we can get such a length. Let me just, I, I would like everybody to always be thinking in simple terms. So if we looked at that data, that data had a frequency of, say, 10 minutes. So if you have a wave with a frequency of 10 minutes and it's traveling at 500 miles an hour, you can compute what the wavelength is just from that. So you should always keep in mind things like that. And, you know, to, to, to ground yourself in the, in the physical problem. So, so um, the message here is that essentially a, you know, a random shape will break up into this dispersive uh, wave train. And I don't know. I mean, it matches the data that you see at the, in the, that were taken in Australia in, in 1960. So that's all I can say about it. Um, it's a plausible explanation for that long, long oscillatory wave train that you, you saw in that data. Uh, whether this is the right explanation, I, I unfortunately have no idea, so I have to just throw it out there. I'm, I'm hiding behind my role here as the mathematician. So I'm going to tell you how to generate pictures like this, and, and I, unfortunately I'll probably convince you that that was hard enough to figure out an accurate enough algorithm to generate these things on your iPad. Um, so okay, so that's the that's the issue of of the dispersion, and and so now let's talk about how do you how do you produce such pictures because it's not completely trivial and and this is meant to be the easy job the the one D problem, and most of the people here are talking about at least two dimensions or sometimes three dimensional problems, and so um, we need to we need to understand how how to solve these simple problems and make them really simple uh, because. That's the first step into understanding these more complex software systems. Okay, so I'm going to start at the very beginning and just talk about the nonlinear advection problem. From a programming point of view, you don't get much benefit from looking at the linear advection problem because the, the, the finite difference equations look like this, and you don't really care whether f is linear or nonlinear in writing that program. Of course, if it's nonlinear, you have to evaluate it. It could be a very complicated function to evaluate, but you're, you know, you're stuck with the complexity of your model. But whether f is, is linear or quadratic really doesn't change very much. So it, it certainly not, it doesn't add any complexity to the, to the program. Um, so the first thing, of course, you should do if you've never done this before, is, is especially if you're a big MATLAB user, is you should write this in MATLAB with a loop. So you just, you know, or i equals 1 to n and j equals 1 to n with a nested loop, and you just write it out in simple code, and run it and see how, see how it does. That will be the, the step one. And I can tell you, you won't get very far, because it's too slow. So you need some leverage here. How many people watch the TV show Leverage? No? TV show. Really? Or are people asleep? Or Okay, NCIS? A few NCIS? CSI. Okay, what, LA? Or you know, which is your favorite? 
Yeah. Nobody watches Leverage. Okay, well, so yeah, go watch it. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, I could get on the web here. We could watch it, uh, and you know, you know, we could watch it on online here, and you'd at least know. But but leverage is an, is a is a clever concept, and and that's the way I think about this. So ultimately, the computer is going to do all the the math for us. But but there are these software layers which can be you know really costly, and MATLAB and Octave are interpreted languages. Um, and, and so is Python. And, and they're very, all of these languages are much easier to work with than, say, C, Java, Fortran, C. Um, and so it's, it's, uh, it's a good idea to use them. Um, they're known in the trade as scripting languages. And scripting languages allow you to write things very quickly and get them running and, and then sort of incrementally build them. And, and often they have tools built in. Um, that make it easy to get codes running. It, maybe file I.O. is built into the language, and, and graphics is built into the language in Octave and, and MATLAB. And these things make it very easy to, to write code and de debug it and um, do rapid prototyping. But there is a certain point at which you need to get something that runs at, at the full performance of the, the CPU you're running on, and so that's where you need the leverage. And, and there's one in, in MATLAB and Octave which is very useful, at least to, as far as it goes, and I'll talk about some of its limitations, um, called Filter. And, and Filter is what, I mean, it can be interpreted as what it sounds like. It is useful as just a, a filter, say, to filter out noise. But it, it has a structure of, uh, or can be put into a framework where it has a structure of a finite difference method. And so this is actually the code, uh, the dot, dot, dots. You know, anytime you write a code, there's always a little bit of stuff that you put in for initializing or preparing for graphics and so forth. So I've left out some details, but this is the essential time-stepping loop. So the four, this is the for loop in, in Octave or MATLAB. The, um, and so you have a number of time steps, and for each time step, you simply update by taking the, the CFL number, which is just the time step over the spatial step, times filter, the vectors A and B define the type of filter, and, and this is the, the nonlinear function, u plus u squared, that is in the equation. So, so this line of code and this line of code are equivalent. That's what filter does. And... Um, Everybody who's used MATLAB or Octave knows about the help facility in, in that. The way you find out about something is you say help command. So help filter in Octave produces the following words. So it's a loadable function, y equals filter, b of ax. So it says the inputs are um, vectors b, a, and x in <coughs> MATLAB and Octave. Everything is, or, is a vector or matrix. And... So it takes in these three things and produces y. And y satisfies the equation given down here. <clears throat> and now you see where you can concoct it, a, a finite difference equation. <coughs> so let's go back and see what I used for, y, for a. a was just one entry. So it's a vector of length 1. So that means in this sum, we're going to ha only have one term. Um, because uh, the length of A is 1, and so N is 0, and so this is an empty, well, this is a sum with only one term, so K equals 0. So it says A of, <clears throat> um, a of plus 1 times, and there, so that's A, and A was just 1, so we can ignore this. This is just saying that Y at N minus K is this expression here involving B. And B is where the difference occurs. B is plus 1, minus 1. So it's going to take the difference of two values. And let's see that here. So what you do is you sum over the different values of B, and you uh, take a, the, you, you translate X by that amount, by the index K. So that's the difference operator. So this is just saying X at N minus X at N minus 1, or 
or minus that. I'm not very good with signs. You'd have to stare at that and see if I got B in the right order to produce this, this finite difference that is required. Okay, but with that, now you've got a simple one-line command, and it's going to do that for you at machine speed. So the way, the, the concept behind MATLAB and, and then implemented in Octave is that you have these high-level operators that are ultimately uh, translated into low-level, highly optimized code. And that's the theme for essentially all of high-performance computing today. I'll, I'll defer to Andy. We'll have a different um, interpretation of this. But I think that is kind of a, the simplest way to say it. It's that the, we think of having these high-level operations, which we work with to simplify our lives, and somewhere that gets translated into highly optimized, low-level code. And so filter is the particular example of that. So this gives you a way to play around with. If you've never, if you've heard that the code you're using, we're going to hear about different code bases uh, these two weeks. Um, and indeed, they are highly optimized at the, at the low level, um, even if they are very user-friendly at the top level. That's the basic idea. And so here you can play with something that's very simple and see how it works. And even you can do timing on it and, you know, work with it as much as you want. Um, so another way to do the same thing is to use a matrix operation. So a finite difference operator is equivalent to multiplying by a matrix, which has plus one, minus one, going down the, the diagonal and, and off diagonal. And so um, fortunately, the, the later versions of MATLAB and now Octave allow you to define sparse matrices. Let's just think about this. If you wanted to have, if you wanted to represent this finite difference operator as a matrix, and you did it as a full matrix, that would be prohibitive. Because we want to solve problems with tens of thousands of points. And so let's just take a simple case, 1,000 points. If you write it down as a full matrix, that's a million entries. So, and every time you multiply by that matrix, if it's represented as a full matrix, the software is dumb. It doesn't know that most of the numbers are, are zero. So that'll be multiplying, you know, doing a million operations every time you need to multiply that by that matrix. Or if you had 10,000 points, it'd be 100 million, and so forth. And, and certainly, I've been doing calculations here with the BDM equation with 100,000 points on a regular routine basis. Um, I've gone up to a million. So um, it's feasible to do that, but not if you do it as a full matrix. That would be infeasible. So that's another thing you should try. So you should try simple loops, try defining the difference operators as a full matrix, see what happens, and then you'll be um, inspired to figure out what a sparse matrix is. So a sparse um, matrix is, is simple to say. You just have um, the indices. And, and so you have, um, you know, you say uh, at index k and k minus 1, I'm going to have a particular value. And so um, given these three vectors, so this is the i vector, the j vector, and the value vector, you take the i vector, the j vector, and the value vector. So this is just three vectors. One is the i index, the other is the j index, and the third one is the value at ij. And you put in this sparse, built-in sparse function, and it gives you a sparse matrix. Now, you don't really want to look at that. You just want to use it. Um, it looks a little bit odd, of course, because it's been made up. It's going to be a compact data structure made up from these things. But uh, that allows you to write that finite difference operator as a sparse operator. And that's another way to do it. So you could use filter, or you could use a sparse operator. And in principle, they should be pretty good. Um, and here is a test. And so again, I encourage you to do tests like this. So here we've got problem sizes. And notice I went from 100, 1,000, 10,000, 100,000 to a million. So that's a matrix of size of a million, which would not fit in your machine, unfortunately, today, if it were a dense matrix. Um, or represented as a, as a full matrix. But as a sparse matrix, it does just fine. And what you see is that, um, so let's just see here. In 
I apologize for the colors. I just don't work very hard at these things. But with, with the, um, these are the default colors. So the aqua triangles with, with the red line corresponds to using filter. And uh, the blue line with the, the green stars is using um, the, the difference matrix, the sparse matrix technology. And so one wins at one size and the other wins at another size. And you've got to decide which you want to work with, um, depending on problem size. And this is, again, not so unusual in scientific computing. You're, they're going to be trade-offs. Sometimes one technique is better than the other, and maybe you don't really care. Maybe in the end, you're going to say, well, is this difference that critical to me? I mean, this is not, maybe it's growing, uh, maybe it's not. I mean, but you say, I'm never going to go above a million. So this is, I don't know, what is this, a factor of five or something? So maybe you don't really care, and that's fine. That's fine. These are both reasonable technologies. They both beat this full matrix approach or the loop approach by orders of magnitude. So, so both are, are, are plausible ways to go. Um, so it turns out if you want to use filter for solving a two-point boundary problem, there are some issues. You can do it. Um, Let's remember the way it works. Let's go back to what filter does. Filter um, ex executes these equations. <clears throat> and so if you had, say, on the left-hand side, a second-order finite difference operator, so something approximating the Laplacian in 1D, so d by dx squared. So that would we know how to do that. We'd have this filter function A, vector A, would be minus 1, 2, minus 1, for example, if it was minus d by dx squared. And over here, you'd have the first order difference if you had, um, you know, if you had a first order derivative you're approximating. So let's look at that, see if that's what I did here. Um, so I said I'll take, um, I'm looking at this problem, I'm taking alpha times u minus ux, u double x, so that happens to be a, a nice, um, the inverse is a nice positive operator. Um, and I implement by, by taking uh, the vector to be um, alpha in the middle component plus uh, here's 1 over delta x squared times minus 1, 2, minus 1. So though you know that is the finite difference operator for the second order derivative. So that's a way to implement that problem. Um, and then you have to think a little bit about what do you choose B to be. So there's some issues with this, the filter. It has some requirements about the leading terms not being zero and so forth. So you have to look at the, the fine detail of it. But this does give you a way to solve this simple problem. Um, so um, let's just see what happens with that. Um, so you know, if you have this two-point boundary value problem, you can probably remember what the solution looks like for the, say, the Green's function. If you have a, a delta function here, that's that little star up there. That's the, my delta. My data is a delta function. In other words, the, the right-hand side is 1 here and 0 everywhere else on the grid. And the grid points are just indicated by these, these symbols. Um, so that's what the solution looks like. It goes from 0 up to here and down to here. And it has a little curvature because because alpha is, is, is not zero. If, if it were, sorry, if alpha were zero, it would just be a straight line. Green's function is just a straight line in, in 1D. Um, but now what does filter do? Well, filter does something a little bit odd when you're thinking about a two-point boundary value problem. It imposes um, uh, Cauchy data on, and, and using the terminology of PDEs, at the the left-hand boundary. That is, it, it, the data is u is 0 and u prime is 0. So the solution comes out flat and then, it, in fact, identically 0 to the point uh, where you have the delta function and then it's non-zero. So that is the solution of that problem, just not with the boundary conditions. I, I, it's the solution to this problem. Sorry, I'm, I keep hitting the left-hand side. So it's a solution to this problem um, with with those data, if you pose it as a two-point boundary value problem, as shown in blue, but if you 
if you say, okay, instead I'm going to have u equal to 0 and u prime equal to 0 at the left-hand side, of course you'll get the solution to be 0 if the right-hand side is 0, and as soon as it's not 0, then something else will happen. You'll get an exponential solution. And that's okay, but if you wanted something to be 0 here, you have to add in a null solution with the right boundary conditions. So all that is possible to do, um, but it complicates things. So um, I tended not to use filter. Once I wanted to go to solving things involving this two-point boundary value problem, I said, you know, I'll live with the extra overhead of the solution of the sparse matrix uh, equations. But uh, let me encourage you to explore this as an issue so you can, if you're willing to work a little bit with filter and subtract off the, the, uh, the, the thing you have to subtract off to get to deal with the, the boundary conditions, then uh, it, it could be a nice alternative for solving these two-point boundary value problems. Uh, and of course, this, co this comes up, this is a core part of the BBM equation, so that's, that's why I'm, I'm talking about it. Okay, so let me, um, enough about software, and let me go back to modeling questions. Um, so, uh, as was mentioned yesterday, there's a key parameter. For some reason, we call it the Stokes number. I don't know why we call it Stokes and not Ursel, but I think Stokes was earlier. I'll say something. I'll try to, next time, talk a little bit about the history of this. So it's useful to think every once in a while about who these people were. So, um, anyway, whether it's the Stokes or Ursel number, it's, it's the ratio of the dispersive effect and, and the, the, uh, um, it's the, it's the ratio of the, um, the, uh, amplitude and the, the, the wavelength in, in terms of, um, the, um, the depth scaled variables. So, um, I've kind of jumped, maybe I should write this out in, in more steps here, but so it's the the amplitude divided by depth is the non-dimensional wave amplitude. And we're thinking about um, water depths of, say, 10 to the fourth meters, that's deep ocean, and amplitudes of order one meter. And then we should say, okay, what, what sort of wavelengths are appropriate? Well, if we took a wavelength on the order of a uh, thousand kilometers, then this expression S works out to be one. So, and that's the considered to be the sweet spot for the BBM and KDB models. Okay, so whatever we call this number, so it's the um, it's the scaled amplitude times the, the scaled wavelength squared. That number is critical for these models. Um, so I was actually involved some years ago in some experiments with these equations and laboratory experiments of long waves in, in a wave tank. So these were done in, in a laboratory. Um, not as big a, a wave tank as was discussed um, a couple of days ago, but um, one with with the appropriate water depth and so forth for for the the equations to be to be appropriate. So with F values s in the right range, and we did experiments with s uh, ranging over two orders of magnitude. So um, when s was larger than ten, uh, it's clear that the model is is not um, accurate, uh, in, in greater, the errors are greater than 10% um, of the experimental measurements. But when S is less than 1, um, it also suggested that the linear dispersive model is as accurate as the nonlinear dispersive model. So when S is small, the nonlinear terms are, are not relevant. Um, but the question of, of the dispersive aspect uh, per se was not so much addressed there. I guess we took it as, at that point, we were taking it as gospel that the dispersive aspect was, was critical. Um, and I guess it, again, depends on how big S is. So that, that is, it depends on what, 
for us, the, the relevant size of the initiated wave is. Um, there's another thing that is really important, and I'll come back to this later, and that is that bottom friction is a dominant effect. And in the laboratory setting, it was really critical and we had to deal with it. So there's, a, there's another scaling here. Um, in, in deep ocean, the, the bottom friction doesn't play a big role. But as you come into shallower water, it does play a role. And it's a complicated model. And, and even if you talk about um, the bottom friction with respect to, say, a steel bottom, if you were in a, in a laboratory, that's already complicated enough. Now, if the bottom is silt or sand or something movable, it's even more complex. So that's something I think where modeling is going to have to advance in the future. And, and this is going to be a, a, an area where computation and modeling could interact in a very productive way, together with experiments, especially if you have a big laboratory, as you do here in Chile. That would be something very, very productive. I, I'm going to suggest what I consider to be a, a, a simple, open problem. At least I've not found anybody to know the answer to it. Ha having to do with the size of, of waves you see on, on in, 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 a, in, in the ocean um, near shore uh, in, in sand, which are presumably generated by, by water waves, but nobody knows quite why the length of the sand waves is, is what it is. Okay, but certainly bottom friction plays a role in that. Um, so I also want to come back to this question about do we believe that KDV and BBM are, are really relevant um, as uh, compared to each other? And um, so there's a theorem there and um, in that in that. 1983 reference, and I'll, I'll describe that in, in a little bit more detail, but a little bit later. And um, it's also the case that there are other possible models. Um, for example, the one given here. So notice the, the, I, the philosophy is you can change a T derivative for an X derivative, and you get an equivalent model. And so we did, we had XXT, here's XTT, and notice the sign switches back. So um, that is another model that is known to be well posed. And by the way, the third and the fourth of the, the possibilities, you triple T, uh, is, is known to be uh, not well posed. So you can forget about that one. But this one is well posed. Um, but it's a little bit of a mess to think about how to deal with this numerically. We're going downhill in terms of uh, numerical simplicity. So this one I can't recommend, but it is useful to know that there, there is a, another possibility here. Um, we'll also see that this UXXT term is not, is not so ad hoc. It's actually embedded in the Boussin-esque model. So it arises naturally there. And those are really the, you know, the original equations, the, the ones that allow varying depth and, and two-way propagation and so forth. Okay, so let me just go over the, the, the basic uh, math here that, that we, you've seen in other talks. And some of you may be very familiar with this, and, and other, others hopefully will benefit from looking at it carefully. So there is a time scale for these models. And, and so how do you get a time scale? Well, you've got you've to take something that is, has time in it to get to get the scale. And so one way to do that is to take the depth and divide it by the, the gravity constant. So everything driving these waves is gravity. So the, the, the reason waves propagate is you get a hump of water that's, that's above the mean depth. And so gravity pushes that down, and it, and it does something. And the time scale on which it does it is given by the depth divided by the gravity constant. And if you remember this from, I remember it from high school, I guess, 32 feet per second per second. So I didn't remember, we never said 32.2. I always remember 32 feet per second per second. Anyway, so we take that number and we take a depth that we like. So if you take the deep water, 10,000 meter, 10, meters, you get a time scale of a half a minute, 30 seconds. So that's the relevant time scale for 
you know, in those non-dimensionalized uh, coordinates. If, on the other hand, the water were significantly shallower, 10 meters, um, then the time scale is a second. So it's not a huge difference. So in other words, we can think about these equations being on orders of, of seconds. So that, to me, I always like to think about what's, what units am I, uh, am I working in. I'll always work in non-dimensional units, so everything will look like one time unit, and one, one space unit. But we need to think about what does that mean in, in minutes and seconds and feet and meters. OK. So order of a few seconds. Um, so when you have small amplitude waves, the wave speed is essentially one if, if you've non-dimensionalized in, in this way. Um, so um, the wave speed is the length scale divided by the time scale. So C, if you go back to my linear advection notation, so the speed of propagation is the depth divided by time. So that's depth divided by this expression we just saw. And that works out to be the square root of the depth times gravity. And, and uh, so depth has units of length. Gravity has units of length over time squared. So when you multiply together, you do get, and take the square root, you get something with the right uh, length scale, length and time scales. And so here's how you can see that the speed of waves in deep water is about 700 miles an hour. And notice how close it is to the speed of sound. Um, so these are about as fast as they could be going without being sonic. Uh, but by contrast, if you're in 10 meters, um, then the speed is about 9.9 .9 meters per second, 22 miles an hour. And so I tried to pick some reference point. So maybe you all remember how fast Usain Bolt ran at the most recent Olympics. So um, he can outrun these ways. I cannot. So <laughs> there you go. And maybe you can. I don't know where you, are. you fit in that scale. But so that gives you a, a sense of the, the, the different speeds and, and, uh, and time scales we're talking about here. Now, how do you compare nonlinearity non and dispersion? Well, here's a very crude way to think about it. Um, Here's my, my amplitude scale. It's the, the physical amplitude divided by the depth. We're thinking about these numbers being extremely small for tsunamis. And we've got a, a wavelength that's the physical length of the wave divided by the depth. And, and maybe here we're not sure how big lambda might be. And, and that's, that's an interesting question. How the waves are generated uh, determines that scale. So maybe we don't know for sure what that is. But then we can say, well, suppose that our, our wave profile is just some function, non-dimensional function of x divided by lambda times the amplitude. And you, you plug this in and you say, well, what if it did satisfy a linear equation? It would look like this. It would be uh, ut plus ux times the wave speed would be 1 plus alpha, that's the, that's the thing coming from the nonlinearity. That's going to be teeny tiny, so we can almost ignore that, plus 1 over lambda squared. The point is that you can translate the, the three derivatives. You can take two of them and just say, well, every time I differentiate, I'm going to get a 1 over lambda. So that's where you get this expression. So this is very rough and ready, but uh, it gives you a sense of, of how to compare KDV with a parameter determining the wavelength um, with a linear advection. And, and so what this says, if, if lambda is really big, then this really does just behave like a, a simple linear advection. But uh, if, it's, if it's smaller, then we should have some, some care. So we know that alpha is going to be 10 to the minus 4, but we're not really sure how to put a physical limit on the wavelength. So how big can the wavelength be? Well, there's some very simple-minded reasoning you can do here, because we know some, some very crude information about how much water actually arrives. So for example, I want you to think about here, suppose the waves were just little square waves. Um, and um, 
So I say a catastrophic wave is something that has enough water to fill a box that's a kilometer long and 10 meters high. Well, you can imagine if you saw a freight train of that size coming at you, that would, that would inundate things, okay? Um, and I, I was told when I visited Crete that they had archeological records of tsunamis that went up 400 meters. 1,200 feet. And at the time I said, ha, huh, archaeologists. And then I thought about it. I said, no, no, oh yeah, yeah, I can see how that happens. And so maybe, let's say, a historic tsunami might be something that big um, that would correspond to a box of water that big. And um, so there, that's some sort of sense of what possibilities are. And I'm in this argument to be very crude, but um, you know that uh, there's a big difference between this amount of water and the bigger box amount of water. And so if we saw things like this, this is where New York comes to an end in the, with the larger box. And this smaller amount is enough to give Hilo major problems. So Hilo is where the tsunami in 1960 had one of the places where it, I, I, I mean, of course, it had a huge impact on Chile, but I mean, at a distance, it, it had a huge impact on Hilo. And the record shows that um, there were measurements at, at some places of, of water going as high as 10 meters, in, within 10 meters above sea level, of the normal sea level at, in, in Hilo. And it went up to a kilometer in inside of, of Hilo. And Hilo, if you've been in Hilo, it's not very, very hilly here. It's um, This is a river coming in. So it's a little bit flat here. And so the water was able to come in a full kilometer and maybe a depth of 10 meters, something, something like that. So it corresponds to more or less this, what I call catastrophic size. Um, but now let's think about it. I mean, how do you get how do you get a box of water that big? So it's got to be um, if it's if it were ten meters high, if the if the tsunami were coming in at an amplitude of ten meters, then it would the wavelength would only have to be a kilometer. That's not very likely. We say it's we measured them to be about a meter in at various stations that, that I indicated yesterday. So then that would be that would correspond to a box. 10 kilometers long and one meter high. So this suggests to me that it, a link scale that might be relevant is on the order of tens of kilometers. Now, I realize this is different from the numbers we saw yesterday, and, and, and these are very rough and ready, so I think we need to talk about this. And I, I don't mean to get into a controversy here about it, but this was my back of the envelope calculation. Um, and certainly, if you had a, a one meter high box of water that was 100 kilometers, it would correspond to something different from what, if that had hit Hilo, it would have been a different story. If it had been, say, 10 meters, 10 kilometers long at 10 meters high, that would have gone further inland than it was measured to go. So I, I don't know, at least it, it, according to my rough and ready calculations, which I... I'm happy to admit I'm off by a factor of 10. But at least these simple uh, facts give you some idea about how big the wave was when it hit Hawaii uh, some 15 hours after it, it left Chile. Um, okay, so that gives us some sense of what size we might have. Um, another thing you can do with this very simple... Yes? Yes. Oh, pointing out the time. Okay, good. Well, let me let me uh, finish up here then. Uh, another thing that you can do here is you can ask, um, how does the depth affect these models? Now, KDV and BBM are derived for constant depth, so varying depth is a no-no. But still, I can ask, suppose I think about what happens as, as I vary the depth, how do things change? But what happens is the nonlinear term becomes more important and the, the dispersive term becomes less important. Okay, and then let me just finish with one of these pictures where I, I did my best here to come up with, you know, some sort of reasonable size of initial wave length um, and, and 
this was uh, an example of a dispersive wave train that you get, which certainly seems to be uh, enough wiggles that it would it would uh, correlate with that data that we we saw earlier. Um, and so here are some exercises that I, I propose. Um, one is to actually compute the area under the curve for the first wave in a dispersive wave train. So that means you've got to you solve this EVM problem, and you're actually going there and say, how much is in that first that first leading wave? Um, and um, also do the evolution with the negative Gaussian, so with the depression. See what happens there. So there are a couple of uh, things to play with. Um, so I'll talk a little bit more about dispersion relations, a little bit of modeling next time, and then get into the actual numerics. Um, now you see I really am a numerical analyst because I'm going to talk about numerical errors in detail and, and, and then talk about how, how do you derive higher order schemes for this because it turns out you really need higher order schemes and that's a nice exercise in numerical analysis. So that'll be next time. So thank you very much. <laughs>